so yes, as Brian said, uh, I'm Keith Land. Um, I've got the name for the role apparently. Um, I've been with EQC for eight months. Uh, this is the second seminar on IFV that we've held at this location. We've probably done them perhaps the wrong way around. The first one was around valuation aspects of IFV, and this one is around the engineering assessment uh, aspects of IFV. Um, what I'd like to do, if I can find the, uh, the right arrow button, um, is just give you a quick introduction um, of how this next half an hour is going to run, give you an overview of where EQC is at with its land program and particularly IFV. Uh, I'll hand over to Seamus sitting behind me who will talk you through specifically how the engineering assessment process works for these types of claims. Talk a little bit about where EQC is at now and where we're going uh, on these claims and more widely. And then we'll do questions as Brian has said which he'll facilitate. So before I go into the presentation, two weeks ago at this session we talked about um, valuation aspects of this type of cover. After that event, I took nine customers' questions at an individual case level away with me. Um, we've answered all nine of those questions, and those customers are generally happier with the situation they're in now than they were prior to the session. Uh, some of them are still working through, and we're working through with them what the solution's going to look like. So if you've got questions which are more of an individual nature, I would prefer if we could do that with you as well and I will commit to you that we'll get back to you within the next two weeks. What we also did at the last session was we had a number of more general questions, uh, a lot of them to do with valuation, but not totally. What you've got in front of you um, isn't a draft, by the way, that is the actual final version. Sorry, it's got a watermark, it's not supposed to have a watermark. Um, those are answers to those more general questions. What we'll do with those, unless there's any significant addition or things we need to add to those topics, they will go on the EQC website uh, after this session. They will also become part of the collateral we're using within IFE fact sheets and also will be fed into our uh, call centre staff so that we're making sure that those questions are being answered consistently for people. So we committed we would get those answers back by today. So uh, they're there for you. Some of you were at the previous session. Um, some of you clearly weren't, but those, those are for you to take away. So before I talk about IFV, I'd like to briefly touch on increased liquefaction vulnerability. Uh, clearly a topic which people are increasingly concerned about because frankly, we still don't have a policy on how we're gonna settle those claims. There are going to be approximately 5,000 people or 5,000 properties which will be confirmed with ILV damage. Um, I'm hoping that we can run another session like this not too far into the future when we'll be able to outline to you how that process is going to work. But as of this evening, I can't really give you too much more certainty on ILV. Um, increased flooding vulnerability, long slide, given that we're being recorded, I'm not going to talk through all the words there. That's the definition of what we can do as EQC within the terms of the EQC Act for this form of land damage. The positive things are that there is cover. The more challenging things are that the cover that we can provide and we can respond to is restricted. And the one thing on that slide which causes the most concern amongst customers and is the most difficult for us to explain to people is how we are not able to recognize off-site effects in IFV land damage. We'll come on to that a little more later. The declaratory judgment which was sought by EQC and others, the others being the insurance companies, uh, the Insurance Council of New Zealand, Christchurch City Council, Southern Response, the Flockton Cluster and a couple of individuals through their own lawyers, was held back in October last year. Um, effectively, the decisions made and um, handed down by that judgment were finalised by the end of January this year. Um, and the key decisions were, one, that IFV is a form of land damage that EQC can recognize. That was fundamental. Uh, the second uh, declaration was that diminution in value is an appropriate way to settle claims. Not all claims, but certainly is an appropriate way to settle some of the claims. It also ruled that IFV is not a form of building damage. It also talked briefly around ILV, so the liquefaction vulnerability, being 
a form of damage that EQC can recognise and also that EQC could use diminution in value as a way of settling those claims. Those were the main decisions that came out. There were some more legal, legally based um, and procedural um, declarations. So given that by the end of January 2015, those decisions had not been appealed, we then took them as the basis on which we would move forward with the settlement of IFV claims, which was what we were planning to do, provided the judgment didn't um, change that. So we started paying IFV claims uh, in March this year, and I'll update you a little bit further into the presentation as to how that is going. So turning to IFV and how we assess uh, IFV damage. The key thing for EQC is that we need to satisfy two, um, uh, two qualification criteria. One, we have to be able to show that there is physical damage to the land and that the land has um, therefore suffered um, damage which can be recognized as increased flooding vulnerability. What we also have to do is show that as a result of that physical change, there is a loss in amenity, which really means a loss in value uh, to that property. And for AQC to pay an IFV land, IFV land damage claim, both of those tests have to be passed. So there has to be an engineering assessment, there then needs to be a valuation assessment, and both have to be in the positive. Uh, so that's what we do. Um, Seamus is going to talk you through the engineering assessment portion of that. Uh, Dave Townsend, who's sitting on my right, uh, presented how we deal with the valuation assessment for diminution in value claims uh, two weeks ago. Um, and I think with the two together, uh, hopefully that will give more clarity on how we're progressing these claims. So I'm going to hand over to Seamus now, who's been working with EQC for somewhat longer than me, uh, certainly pre-Canterbury Quakes, but been very much uh, one of the key people working on the um, response to the Canterbury earthquakes. So Seamus, I've stolen quite a lot of your time. All right, thanks Keith. Just make sure I can be heard. If I get uh, sick of talking into the mic, I might get it down. Um, so as Keith said, uh, I've worked with EQC since day dot, since the very first earthquake occurred in Canterbury and I've been a, um, part of all of the different types of land damage assessments that we've worked our way through um, from the simple, uh, fairly obvious claims which are related to sand um, at the surface or cracking in the land and um, landslides and uh, rock falls up on the port hills uh, through to the more complex types of land damage that we're now dealing with the uh, IFV and ILV claims. Um, this is a, a fairly typical slide. Um, this is what we as uh, EQC's engineers go out and look at. We, we look at the specific areas of land that um, EQC provides cover for. Um, I think it's probably pretty familiar to most of you. It's the land underneath the dwelling, the land that forms an eight metre halo around the dwelling and some land that um, comprises the access way. The intention of that being that um, you can um, get to your house, you can support your house and have some land around it. Um, and, and come out of the out of the natural disaster event in, in that way with that insurance. Um, that's uh, nothing new, and and we've been uh, and and I certainly have been assessing claims on that basis for for over ten years now. Uh, increased flooding vulnerability is a little bit newer. Um, this is. Um, uh, the type of land damage that had largely been untested uh, by uh, the work that we had done before the earthquakes occurred, principally because we hadn't had a, a significant earthquake event where EQC had responded in this way. Um, it's not just new for New Zealand, it's pretty much new for um, the entire world. Um, so there's been a lot of work go into um, where this, this well, what's contained in this presentation tonight. I'm going to go through it as as as, as quickly as I can to provide you with an overview and then um, hopefully get into the questions so that we can um, we can respond to your uh, individual inquiries rather than dwell on each of these each of these slides um, clearly as um, as uh, Keith has sort of alluded to what we look at when we when we're looking at increased flooding vulnerability is whether or not the uh, insured land is uh, vulnerable to flooding and whether or not that insured land that's vulnerable to flooding has become more vulnerable, as a, and generally it's become more vulnerable as a result of subsidence um, of that land um, that was caused by the earthquakes, um, by, by the shaking, the consolidation of the soils or the ejection of materials from beneath the ground or something like that. 
um, as Keith said, um, flooding that occurred pre the earthquakes or flooding that now occurs after the earthquakes as a result of changes um, to land outside of that land that's insured by EQC or because of changes to the drainage system, whether that be a natural drainage system like a river and the gradient of the river. Um, or, or, or the changes to the river um, channel, um, or uh, artificial drainage system um, being pipes and damages, uh, damage to pipes. Um, that, that's something that EQC can't address. Uh, when we're looking at increased vulnerability, we look at, um, at, at uh, the flooding effects from, from three different sources effectively. Um, we look at, um, and, and these are probably in the inverse order of, of the way uh, the public would generally see flooding. Um, th there's a small uh, effect from uh, super high tides, um, which is clearly um, related to uh, coastal areas. Um, in Christchurch, it's pretty much um, located around the um, Heathcote Avon estuary. There's um, what we call pluvial, which is effectively the um, rain. Um, the technical guys will call that rain on grid, so we, we can um, measure what rain falls on, on the, the land, and then um, we can model the way that rain pools and ponds and, um, and then effectively tries to get into the rivers. And we can also deal with I guess um, what, what, what you generally think of in terms of flooding, which is the rivers filling up with water and eventually um, their banks overtopping and water spilling out over the surrounding land. Um, this is a schematic which, which um, I guess goes some way to trying to uh, show very sim simply um, how uh, the land has responded to the earthquakes and one of the, the, the simplest versions of um, IFV type land damage. So you can see you've got your house with um, uh, confined inside the property boundary and you've got a, a, a river um, channel out to the right as you're looking at it uh, and that uh, river channel um, floods um, but the, the floodwaters don't come onto the, onto the property. Um, as a result of the earthquake um, shaking and uh, the, the liquefaction or the consolidation of materials on that property and, and potentially even some tectonic um, movement, uh, the elevation of the land um, that EQC covers may have decreased um, relative to where it was before the earthquakes, um, which means that um, in some situations the uh, river now floods across that property or, um, land or rain that falls on that property pools in areas where it didn't pull before. Uh, this is the uh, this is where we start to get into a bit of a um, complex part of the process. This uh, slide demonstrates what we as um, engineers have to go through um, to determine whether or not the property qualifies in an engineering sense um, for for uh, as a candidate for IFV. And I say as a candidate um, in the engineering sense because. Um, uh, Dave and his valuers have to come along after we've been uh, on the property effectively and um, determine whether or not, um, if we've said that there has been some change, whether that's resulted in a material change in the value of the property. Um, so effectively what we do is we create a model um, and we determine the flood depths for, um, on the creation of that model. Um, we have a series of thresholds. Um, the thresholds are, are quite widely um, and publicly available. They, they relate to the, the thickness or the depth of the of the exacerbated flood um, that has occurred across the sequence of the earthquakes, and there's four major land damage causing earthquakes. Um, they, the, the, there's another threshold which relates to the depth um, of the flood that has occurred just as a result of any individual earthquake event. Um, so for the first threshold, it's 200 millimetres across the sequence. Uh, the second threshold is um, 100 millimetres of um, exacerbated flooding depth. Um, in, in any one earthquake event and um, and then we look and see whether the property has suffered um, any land damage and, and that is assessed in a number of ways. Um, as you can see the, the right hand box there there's an exceptions uh, uh, to that which effectively says even if you don't qualify for one or all of those um, there's still other ways where you may ultimately qualify for um, an IFV um, engineering yes um, situation. Uh, Following on from that work that we do, which is largely driven by the models um, and the information we've already collected across Christchurch um, between um, when the earthquake started and present day, um, we do site specific assessments um, to see whether the information that the models have um, provided us uh, is represented on what we see on the ground. Um, we then go through a re engineering review process and um, if, if everything aligns then um, we come out um, at the end with a, any individual property being potentially IFV or not qualifying in an engineering sense for IFV. Uh, the potential IFV properties are the ones that go through to Dave's team and, um, and, and effectively work their way back to EQC um, resulting in 
uh, if there's a valuation, yes, um, uh, communication from EQC around um, what your IFE settlement will be. Uh, the flood mod modelling is clearly um, quite important. Uh, flood modelling is nothing, nothing particularly new. Um, Christchurch City Council had run uh, flood modelling before um, the earthquakes occurred, um, largely to understand what areas would be affected and, and to aid in planning. That's where flood modelling, and, and our company does a lot of flood modelling for different councils around New Zealand, is used. So, so planning um, where, where, um, where to develop next effectively, or, or what limitations to put on development in, in flood prone areas. Um, what we've got there is, a, is, a, is a, a snapshot of the whole of Christchurch, so there's no way you're going to be able to see any individual property on that, but it effectively shows the areas that flood more and the areas that flood um, on, a, on a slightly lesser scale, blues and reds being um, significant depths of floods modelled on those properties or in those areas. Um, some of those areas are, are largely rural. Um, and the yellows and greens, which are quite hard to uh, hard to see on that, um, particularly on this display, being areas where where the floods are or, or the depth of the um, flood is is less, more like 100 or 200 millimetres. Uh, Christchurch is quite complex, as I'm sure um, you're aware. Uh, the Avon is um, a, a, an old or a, almost an existing overflow channel uh, of the Waimakariri River. Um, Christchurch is clearly protected by some flood defence measures um, between the city and um, the WIMAC. Um, there's a number of other catchments that, uh, that, that input into uh, the way the flood model's developed. Um, there's, there's the three main rivers, the Heathcote, the Avon and the Styx, um, and on top of that we've got that uh, purple hatched area there which is the, um, the, the uh, spring tide, or the effects of the spring tide, and where those are, are most likely to be, um, to be felt. Uh, t clearly, to um, input into those into that flood model, um, so to, to get the depths of the water on on the land, we need to know the elevation of the land and the way that the water would flow across the elevation. Uh, the way we d d uh, determine the elevation and indeed the change in elevation, so we can get the change in the um, flood depth or the exacerbated flood depth as a result of the earthquakes, is is using lidar. Uh, that's an acronym for light detection and ranging where effectively an aeroplane flies along and it shoots um, information down. Uh, that, that information bounces off the ground and it's, at the time it takes is recorded and interpreted into an elevation. A huge amount of, um, of data is gathered on every individual LIDAR flight path. The planes fly backwards and forwards over the city and they can collect elevation information at a number of times at, at each point um, that they collect. Uh, the LIDAR that was flown after every um, earthquake event um, measured points that were about um, 100 millimetres apart on the ground. Uh, the LIDAR is um, uh, adjusted, uh, for want of a better word, after it's flown to take out um, effects that are related to changes in the elevation of the aeroplane as it flies along its path, um, the effects of vegetation. Um, clearly, if you run two similar surveys, one in winter and one in summer, you're going to have trees full of, um, full of leaves, which causes... Uh, causes erroneous um, changes in elevation effectively because the, the LIDAR information bounces off the first target. Uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, a lot of cleansing of that uh, information that happens. Um, it's, it's undertaken all over the world. It's not nothing new um, and the people and the entities that do that work are very skilled at um, picking out what is land and what is not land from the survey. Uh, the good thing, I guess, is that um, before the earthquakes events, we had a base layer, which was a LIDAR that had been run pre, pre the earthquakes, and that was largely run by Christchurch City Council for their flood modelling um, before the earthquakes. So that was fortuitous in some ways. And this is what we end up with, um, a, a multicoloured map showing the, the cumulative change in elevation uh, across the city. Um, that, that occurred as a result of the um, whole earthquake sequence. And what you can see there is that the pinks are the areas where the greatest change and, and uh, down um, has occurred. Uh, the yellows and um, oranges are where there's, there's been some change um, in a downwards direction again, but uh, to a lesser extent. Uh, and the greens and blues are where there's been a change upwards. Um, and that's largely uh, due to tectonic uplift. And you can see that that's associated with the southeast part of the city down um, in the sort of uh, Wollstone and Ferry Mead Heathcote areas, and that's associated with um, fault uh, movement uh, largely um, from the, the February and, and, and June events. Uh, what we do, um, and, and, and I guess what we're talking about here is modelling some um, flooding, so we're, we're effectively pouring water into a, into a 
a topographical model, um, a DEM, uh, and, and that takes a lot of computer power. Um, what we end up with is um, a map of Christchurch which showing us the different depths and the different extents of, of where, the, um, where that model says uh, uh, the floods will extend to. Uh, the reason I've got this here, this is, this is sort of an area, this is um, Flockton Basin um, effectively, uh, and this is what the flood models that we used um, based on the um, storm that occurred in March last year predicted um, would be the extent of flooding. Um, and this is what was observed in that same area as a result of the storm that occurred in March. So if I flick backwards and forwards, you can see that um, the model um, correlates reasonably well um, with, uh, with what, what actually occurred, um, which gives us some um, encouragement um, as to the, the, the validity of the model. Um, if anything, in, in many areas, the model is slightly over-predicting, which is um, for the benefit of um, someone who's looking for an IFE settlement, um, pr probably uh, on the positive side. Uh, there's a huge amount of other information that's used. Uh, this is just some of the uh, work that we put together um, in, in terms of our pack and, our, and that our staff use to determine whether or not an individual property has, um, has qualified in an engineering sense for IFV, as you can see. Uh, some of this information uh, is ultimately uh, provided to the customer um, when I say this, some of the information that's on the screen, the information that we use is provided to um, EQC's customers uh, in the land settlement pack when, when the land settlement decision is made and sent out to you. So that's, uh, that's just, um, I guess, our flowchart again saying that w what, the, what the process is. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the exceptions here, which is this box out to the right hand side. Um, and, and, and I touched on it before, uh, the, 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 the beauty of that process and the beauty of the declaratory judgment was that, um, that, that it asked us not to do a broad sweep um, across, uh, across every property and just make the same decision for every property, or, um, whether that be on a block by block basis or on a suburb by suburb or all of Christchurch. Um, and so the declaratory judgment asked for some, uh, some site specific information to be considered um, at every stage and in theory, um, while this slide doesn't necessarily articulate that well, it, it, it is saying that just because you haven't met one of the thresholds or in fact all of the thresholds, there's a number of exceptions. Um, and, and, and the purpose of um, our site specific engineering assessment is to, um, to, to go out and physically touch those properties that the model's saying are affected. Um, and, and determine whether or not um, what the model's telling us is, is, is real, um, because there are, uh, we, we, we can come up with situations where, where um, the flood depth um, that's shown on the model is on the highest part of the property um, for, for an anomalous reason. And, um, and so we can look at that and see that on site. Uh, also, um, one of the, th the thresholds that we, we require in our initial assessment is the, whether or not land damage has occurred. Um, and clearly there's areas of Christchurch where while, while you didn't get the classic type of land damage that everyone's used to, which is excessive amounts of silt on the surface or cracking of the land or something, land, that land has gone down um, relative to where it was before the uh, earthquake sequence began. And so that's basically saying even though the, the initial assessment says you must have some form of land damage, there is um, invisible land damage, um, damage that isn't um, visible to the naked eye, the lowering of the land, and, and, and we can determine that as well. Uh, there's, there's also information about, uh, or, or there's exceptions in relation to um, the, the, the uh, return period, uh, as it were, of the flood, uh, where um, the uh, event that we use um, to initially assess whether or not um, IFE has occurred as a 1% as a annual exceedance probability or a 100 year return period flood. Um, what we do is we also look at more frequent um, but less, uh, if I can use the word, significant um, flooding events, so where there's less water involved um, and, and we check to make sure that um, the properties that are appear to be um, not affected by the 1 in 100 year events are not affected by events that occur more, more regularly. Uh, and that's the type of event that um, largely occurred in March last year, sort of in between um, those, uh, those, those event exceedances. And I think that's it. Back to Keith. Um, so thanks, Seamus. Sorry, can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, so what I'd like to do now is just sum up 
uh, quickly before we go into questions and answers. Uh, so the next steps for increased liquefaction vulnerability claims, um, as the slide says, there are two bullets up there. One, we are looking to finalize our approach in July. Um, I'm hoping it will be in June, but I think realistically it's more likely to be July. Uh, once that is done, we will start settling ILV claims in line with that policy. Uh, that's going to take us some months to complete, um, so we will look to get as many of those paid in 15 as we can, but realistically we're going to be continuing into 2016. Uh, and we will communicate a lot more around increased liquefaction vulnerability once we have that clarity. So then coming back to increased flooding vulnerability, where we're at as of today is that a number of uh, settlement packs have been sent out to customers, which broadly started the middle of March. So we have been writing to customers who have been confirmed as having uh, IFV damage, and their claims have been settled by diminution in value um, methods. Uh, we've sent out uh, settlement packs also to customers whose um, engineering review has actually now shown that there was not IFV damage to the property based on the methodology that's been described to you this evening. Um, we've sent out approximately 400 packs and each of those customers receives a pack which is quite comprehensive. We talked them through uh, two weeks ago. If anyone wants to see what a a pack looks like, we can pretty much do that afterwards. But realistically, there's engineering information, valuation information, there's a fact sheet on how IFV works, there's a fact sheet on how diminution in value works, there's a land settlement summary which outlines the, uh, the dollars attached to the IFV damage. It also picks up any visible land damage claim that may still be due to be paid as well. And what we're looking for there is to give people certainty across any outstanding claims. Everyone who gets a pack, whether it's a yes or a no, and the information for a no pack is pretty much consistent with a yes pack. So there are engineering maps uh, and there are explanations about how they work. Everyone who gets a pack will also get a phone call from EQC to talk through the detail of that settlement pack. The purpose of that call is to help clarify anything that needs to be um, clearer. It's also to give people the opportunity to decide if they want to review the decision. One of the things we want to do at EQC is to give people fair chance to review decisions. This is, as uh, Seamus has said, and as Dave said when we talked two weeks ago, this is unprecedented. EQC has not done this before. Insurers haven't actually paid this type of land damage anywhere on earth before. And therefore, fundamentally, we think we've got a good process. We've reviewed it globally to make sure that it is sensible, logical, fair, um, and will work. But we won't get it right every time. Um, we will be based on the information we've got. You may well have, as customers, more information than we do. If you do, please bring it, let's review the decision and let's make sure we do get them right. Uh, so those phone calls are about making sure that we get that dialogue going. Feedback so far uh, has been, and I'm going to say generally positive. A lot of the people who've had yes settlement packs sent have said, yes, I get that, I understand it, um, and generally, please pay me. We are getting questions on one to seven visible land damage. I would expect that. We got lots of questions on one to seven visible land damage when we settled the previous 53,000 or so um, claims of that nature. Uh, so that's expected. Uh, we've had two customers so far have said they want to formally challenge the decision. I think that's remarkably low. I don't take that as we've solved everything. I think it's early. You know, we're a few hundred in, we've got thousands to go. But generally, so far the feedback has been positive. The content of the packs is getting reasonably positive uh, comment as well. There's a lot of information, but with the, with the phone call as well as the, the information in the pack, I think we're getting that information across pretty well. Um, we've also sent packs to people who have been confirmed as not having IFV. Uh, we actually chose to write to people who've got no IFV according to our approach and also have no visible land damage to be paid. So in some ways they're getting the, the complete opposite, which is there's nothing coming from EQC. Um, the feedback on those calls generally has also been actually quite positive. A lot of people have said, good, at least I haven't got it. 
now I know that, I can actually get on. Some people have quite clearly said, no, 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 that's absolutely wrong. Um, I want to talk to you further about how you got to that conclusion. And those are the discussions we would have in a review process. Um, if I was therefore to summarize the key things from an IFE viewpoint at this stage, I'd like to thank the customer advocacy group, which is a group of agencies that we work with, including uh, Nikki's team, uh, RAS, uh, Cancern, Age Concern, the Psychosocial Group, a number of TC3 organizations, the Flockton Cluster, uh, and a number of other community organizations. They've helped us put these packs together in terms of what's in and what's out. They help us challenge our processes. They help us give feedback on how we move this thing forward um, in a way that is, is clearer for people. Um, we use, as I say, settlement packs in writing. We make phone calls to people to support that. The website, I will openly admit, has got a little bit of navigation challenge in it, but there's a lot of very good current information on the website. And this opportunity here for us to have face-to-face -face discussion with people is clearly hugely important as well. EQC is committed to this hub continuing for the rest of this year. We may have to help some of our other agencies ensure that happens. We want a face-to-face -face capability here, and we also have a face-to-face -face capability um, as part of the EQC infrastructure in Christchurch. So we're looking to share information. We want your feedback. Thank you for the questions. I'll say that in advance. Um, we will answer those questions. If we can't answer them tonight, I commit to you, I will take them away, and we will get back to you quickly, generally, and specifically if it's on your own case. 